السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Today we'll talk a little bit about money the Islamic perspective about money or the nature of money in Islam and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, cryptocurrencies بإذن الله تعالى and what many Muslim scholars have said about them Try to understand this new technology. Now, basically, yani so uh, this is in front of me here. This is the definition of of money from Britannica. We said it's a commodity accepted by general consent as a medium of economic exchange. So, the word commodity, of course, it's uh, debatable. It's controversial. There are people who don't believe that money should be a commodity. And sometimes money was a commodity. Other times it was not a commodity. Because commodity is something that has value. Right? So by looking into the history of money, we try to understand. We say, okay, this term here used by this, uh, this source, at least it is, it is controversial. It's not something that is agreed upon. But we are not going to stop at it. But it is something, it's a mode of payment that is accepted by general consent as a medium of exchange in any specific society, in any specific community, right? And it is the medium in which prices and values are expressed as, as currency. So currency is the expression of money. Money is expressed most of the time in the form of currency. It circulates anonymously from person to person because it doesn't have a name. When you give $20, a bill of $20, $100 to someone else, it doesn't have your name, right? Uh, and this person will give it to someone else and then the other person will give it to another company or a business. So it doesn't have to have a, an identity here, even though there are people who said these bills have serial numbers, but no one is paying attention to these serial numbers, right? No one tried to memorize them or know them. You're worried about uh, the value of the money, how much it, uh, you can buy with it, and the, the purchasing power. So, and from country to country, to facilitate trade. So the purpose of using money is to facilitate trade, which is, which is exchange of goods and services. And it is the principal measure of wealth. It is the principal measure of wealth. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Now, when we talk about the functions of money, whenever the ulama, scholars, Muslim or non-Muslim scholars, all of them, they said these are the main functions of money, medium of economic exchange. People use it to exchange, as I said, goods and services. It is a store of value. When you have 1,000 or 10,000 Canadian dollars at home or in, the, in your bank account, you know how much you have, you own, and it is a value. It has some value. You know that you can use it to buy things. You buy services or, good, or goods. So it is a store of value. Maybe it's not a perfect, not all forms of money are perfect stores of value. Right? But this is something else. But in general, money is supposed to be a store of value. And it is a unit of account. Now, what are the different types of, of money? There is commodity money. It's money that has an intrinsic value like gold and silver. This is what is called commodity money. And this is the money that the Quran mentioned. And it is, it's the money that used to be, that they used to be used at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu was born in Mecca, he grew up in Mecca, he moved to Al-Medina. During his time, people were using the Roman dinars made of gold, and they were using dirham, the Persian dirhams, and it was made of silver. That was their money at that time. Later on, there are some, some khulafa or some rulers who created a third type of money. It's called uh, from copper. And it is, uh, they, they started using coins, copper coins. And in Arabic, it's called al-fulus. 
So this is what el fulus. The term fulus is coming from these copper coins. But this is all commodity money. Representative money is a certificate or a token that can be exchanged for the underlying commodity. And this ended in 19, to the best of my knowledge, in 1971, right? When Pre President Nixon, uh, you know, decided that there would be no connection between the US dollar and the gold. That's it, there was no connection from that time. It was disconnected. But before that time, supposedly, by law, if you have methane a bill of 100 American dollars, if you go to the bank, you, can, you have the right to give them this bill and they give you its value in gold. In theory, Allahu Alam, if it was possible in practical life, I'm not sure if people used to do it, used to go to the bank, give them money, and then they receive gold. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about that. But in theory, at least that was the case. That was the case before 1971. Fiat money, it has no intrinsic value. And it does not represent any underlying commodity, which is paper money. So the money that we are using these days is called fiat money. So the, it has no relationship with gold or any other asset. It's a money that was decreed and declared as an official money by the government or used as a legal tender. They call, it, they call it a legal tender. That means it is legally accepted by the government, uh, accepted as you know, tax payment, accepted for you know, credit payment, for anything. Like a society, in a specific society, this is the official money. It's called legal tender. And nowadays, as I said, it is fiat money. Why we, it, it has no intrinsic value? Because if the government decide not to use methane, these Canadian dollars, these bills that we have nowadays, if they create a new form of money, then the money that you have at home will have no value, it's just paper. So it derives its value from the decision of what? Of the government or the central authority. They decided that they should be used as a money and that's it, it has no real money, real value in itself. Now, general characteristic of money, by looking at the history of money, it has to be durable. Durable, that means if you, if you take it from one place to one place, you use it, pass it from one hand to one hand, it's not affected, it's still good, in a good shape, and, uh, well, if you go to some countries, they give you some old bills, but they're still using them. But in general, money, money should be durable, should be easily portable. In the old days, during the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they used to use these golden dinars and dirhams, and they used to put them in bags. So if you have a big quantity of dinars, you have to carry a bag, and people pay attention that you're carrying something. Yeah? Nowadays, if you have like 1,000 Canadian dollars in your wallet, no one will pay attention to, to you, right? Because it's in your wallet. So money should be easily portable. At, at a certain time in history, cows were using as a form of money. Flowers, shells. So imagine a cow taking, because you wanna buy something from the market, you take your cow, sell, give it to someone, and he would give you something. So it's not easily portable. It should be divisible because, I mean, uh, people, the, 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 the goods that the people use have different values. There are things that are expensive. You need to spend a big amount of money, but there are things that are very cheap and you cannot spend like methane, you cannot buy them with, let, let's say at the time of Rasulullah they had this golden dinar which has uh, the weight of this dinar was 4.25 grams of pure gold. That's the value of what? Around these days, around 320, 350, between 320 to 350 Canadian dollars. So if you have this dinar only, and you don't have the dirhams, because it was equivalent to 10 dirhams, then it will be difficult for you, you know, to buy something cheap, milk, 
or or some uh, or bread or something very cheap that doesn't need like you don't need uh, one one golden dinar to spend on it. So anyway, it has to be divisible. It has to be uniform. Uniform. It's all the same. The same golden dinar that is used مثلاً, in this city should be used in the other city in Edmonton in Ottawa. The same bills that are used being used in Calgary. They are used in uh, different cities, different uh, towns. So it's uniform. And it should be, it should come with limited supply because if it is widely available, then it has, it will have no value, right? It will have no value and people have to carry a big amount of money to buy, to buy, you know, something, uh, a car. Well, I have seen, I have seen, uh, I, I watched the news in Lebanon just a uh, few weeks ago. Someone was talking, uh, someone who was supposed to import cars from, from a different country, you know the amount of money that he was sending to the airport to pay for the cars? Like th this money was carried in boxes. Yeah, because the Lebanese money now, uh, they use the lira or the real? The lira, right? Yeah. Lira. Yeah, so it has no value. So they had to carry their money in boxes to send them to the airport and to make the payment for a few cars that he was supposed to receive from a different country. Anyway, so it has to be, it has to come with a limited supply. And it is accepted as a payment. And this is the most important thing. It is accepted as a payment. By looking at the statements of the ulama, uh, you, yeah, this is the most important uh, statement. What is Sharia money? Now, this is very important. As I said, at the time of Rasulullah it was commodity money, gold and silver. Then we had the Islamic dinar. Who minted the Islamic dinar? The books of history are saying it was Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, the fifth Umayyad Caliph. But there are some other Muslim scholars who said Umar ibn Khattab himself tried to mint some dinars. But I'm not sure why. I shouldn't say he was not successful, but his dinars were not popular, were not known. Maybe because he didn't create a specific department. Like Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he created a specific department for this operation. And he hired judges, judges to supervise the minting of the Islamic dinar. So uh, he, he hired people to work in this department it was a separate department in the, in the government, and that's why maybe his dinar was very popular. It was used in different places, different towns. So uh, also Abdullah ibn Zubair tried to mint some, some money during his time, but he was a caliph for a short period of time, and that's why his money was not very popular. Anyway, most of the Muslim scholars attributed this invention to Abdul Malik, Ibn Marwan. They said there was a misunderstanding between him and between the Roman emperor who wanted to, because, there, uh, who wanted to, uh, because of this misunderstanding, he wanted to place an insult for the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in a golden dinar. So Abdul Manik Ibn Marwan, at that time, he became very upset. And he decided to stop using the Roman dinars at that time, said we're going to make our own dinars. And then he created this department within the Muslim state uh, at that time. And they started, and it was the first dinar was minted in the year 77 after the hijra of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa 77 in the hijri calendar. That would be uh, 77 plus 622. That will be uh, 679, 679, 699 in the Gregorian calendar. That would be 699, and that was the first Islamic dinar that was minted under the rule of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, radiyallahu anhu, rahimahullah. He was not a Sahabi. He was an Umayyad caliph, and he was a scholar. They said he was a scholar. He was a faqih. And then the, and during the Abbasid era, they continued using the same 
currency, dinars and dirhams. During the time of Imam Ahmed, I'm not sure if it was within his community or he was asked about a different community who wanted to start using the copper coins, al-fulus, and he said, if they agree on it, that's fine. If they agree, if they make an agreement and they are fine with using these copper coins, then the Mamluks, also the Mamluks, they are the kings, they were kings of Egypt. Uh, during their time, they kept using the same uh, commodity money. The Ottomans were using the same thing, of course, with different writing, with different printing, with different... Uh, sometimes they would write uh, some, an, an ayah from the Qur'an, or they say, Muhammad Rasulullah, or they say, La ilaha illallah, and the dinar. Or sometimes they would uh, print the name, they mint it with the name of the caliph and the date of minting. So, the, so this money came in different forms. But it was a commodity money. Now representative money was used later on and then we ended up using fiat money during uh, this time which has no intrinsic value and it doesn't represent any asset. Now the question is, did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa tell Muslims about gold and silver, about you know, the golden dinars and the, the dirhams they were, which were made of silver? Did he say that this is our money? This is a very important question. Our money should be made from gold and silver. Did he say that? There is nothing. There is no hadith. No hadith, nothing in the sunnah that suggests that Rasulullah Sallallahu said anything about the form or the shape of money. No comment at all. So he left it as it is. He did not interfere with the nature of money. It was, he was born in Mecca, people were using these golden dinars and dirhams made of silver. And he kept using the same currency. But he told people about the rules of riba. He, told to, uh, he taught Muslim the rules of zakat. He explained, uh, you know, he, he taught them about how to use money in a halal way. He talked about different transactions that are halal. He mentioned different transactions that are haram. But he did not say anything about the nature of money. And this is very important. Why? Because there are some Muslims who believe that this should be, the gold and silver is sunnah money. What do they mean by sunnah money? That we Muslims are not supposed to use paper money. That our money should be made of gold and silver. That is the opinion and the view of some Muslims. And they are a very small minority. Overwhelming majority of Muslim scholars accepted representative money. They accepted fiat money. They said this money that it is accepted by societies now and commu different communities. And it is fine to use this money and we shouldn't feel guilty. We shouldn't feel guilty. Even if we believe that fiat money is not a perfect system, that's a different story. If you believe that fiat money is not a perfect system, that's fine. We know that the, it has problems, it has issues, inflation and the printing of money and uh, stealing. Actually, their governments are stealing from people, right? But, but still, it, is, it was accepted by Muslim scholars as a form of money. Why? Because even the Quran, when you, مثلا, the Quran, the Quran spoke about gold and silver, but it didn't say this should be your money. Your money should be in the form of, it should be made of gold and silver. The Quran talks about collecting gold and silver and not paying zakat. About the dangers of collecting gold and silver and not paying zakat. That's very dangerous. So the Quran talks about zakat, but doesn't tell us that this is your money. And in Surah Al-Kahf, they were used to use uh, coins at that time. One of them, or some of them, told one of the youth who escaped and they went to the cave, take this coin, go to the town, and buy some food for us. Their coins were made of gold and silver. Allahu alam, maybe I think silver, warik, 
because the Quran mentioned warriq and this is silver. So it was made of silver. But, but it doesn't tell us that this should be your money, right? It should be made of gold and silver. The Quran talks about protecting, the importance of protecting wealth, that we are not allowed to devour the property of other people without a valid reason to take the property of other people. Uh, no instructions about the shape or form of money, clear instructions about riba and zakat, plenty of ahadith, ayat in the Quran about the rules of riba, right? But nothing about the form of money. We have the story of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. During his time, he said, لَقَدْ هَمَمْتُ أَنْ أَصْنَعَ الدَّرَاهِمْ مِنْ جُلُودِ الْإِبِلِ فَقِيلَ لَهُ إِذَنْ لَا بَعِيرٌ فأمسك. هذه القصة موجودة في مرطأ مالك وفتوح البلدان البلادري. So Umar ibn Khattab, he said, I, I thought about making money out of the skin of camels. He wanted to slaughter camels, take their skin, and make money out of the skin of camels. So people around him told him that there will be no camels left. All of them will be slaughtered, and then there will be no, no camels left. So now he changed his mind and did not do it. Now, there are some, some uh, if you read the research of some Muslim scholars nowadays, they said this story is not, uh, they are not sure if it is reliable or not. Yani the, by looking at the chain of transmission, the chain of narration, the one who narrated this story is in Hassan al-Basri. And Hassan al-Basri did not live, or he was born when he died, when Umar al Khattab died, Hassan al-Basri was three years old. So they said it's impossible that Hassan al-Basri heard anything from Umar al Khattab which means that this narration is disconnected. This is something that we study in the science of hadith, right? But uh, it is found in Muta' al-Imam Malik. When I used to study in the city of uh, Medina, uh, our teachers used to say that many scholars of hadith have looked into the book of Imam Malik and they verified all the, the narrations of this book, they said they are connected from other sources. So they looked at them and they found that their chain of narration, the chain of narration of all these ahadith are connected. This verification happened in different uh, sources. But we have the statement of Imam Malik himself. He said, if people decide to make money, they were to agree to make money out of skins, I would, I would dislike for them to use it as a deferred payment for, you know, to buy another form of currency. You know, if you, if you buy, if you buy currency with another currency, it has to be a spot trade. The delivery has to be immediate. This is, uh, this is aqd al-sarf, it's called aqd al-sarf. If you buy Canadian with American, you know, to make it halal, to avoid the riba of delay, the, the, the transaction has to be uh, on the spot. So the delivery has to be uh, immediate delivery. So everyone will receive the counter value within the transaction, within the same transaction. Cannot be delayed. So Imam Malik, he said, if people use money out of the skins, uh, I want them to follow the rules of riba. Right? Which means that it means that Imam Malik would be fine if people decide to create another form of money other than gold and silver. This is what it means. And this is the conclusion of many Muslim scholars like Sheikh Islam Rutaymiyyah, Ibn al-Qayyim, al-Ghazali, and many classical scholars. They, they have a decision. They said that money does not have any defined or specific condition and, it, and it, it is left to the urf, to the customary practices of people, an understanding and agreement of people. This is a decision that was made or a conclusion that was reached by these Muslim scholars. So that if people agree on any form of money, then it, and it is accepted within that specific society, then it should be used as a form of money and all the rules of riba have to apply to this form, uh, the new form of money, 
and people have to pay zakat on it if they own it. Because people have used shells, have used many things in the past, right? And this is the, also the Hanafi legal school. They, uh, they assert that currency is that which people deem by common usage and social congruence. Social congruence, yani social agreement. If they agree on something to be used as a form of money, that's fine. And, and they have to respect the rules of riba and pay zakat on it. And that was also the statement of Imam Ahmed, as I said, when he was asked about uh, copper coins or flus. Now let's talk about Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. Now, cryptocurrency, this is the definition of in, in, in Investopedia. They said it's a digital or a virtual currency uh, secured by cryptography, which is a hidden language, a very special language used by uh, computers nowadays, and based on a network that is distributed across a large number of computers. This is the definition. If you want to study about cryptocurrencies, I think Investopedia is providing good amount of information. You can go and read what they say about cryptocurrencies. Now, why do we care about Bitcoin? This is a very good question here. Because people, I mean, might say, uh, uh, you know, many people are doing things, creating different modes of transactions. They are inventing different uh, forms of money. Why should I care as a Muslim? If I feel uh, I don't feel confident about these kind of transactions or these kind of products, why should I care about them? I will just stick to the traditional form of money. I'll do business in my own way. Why should I care about Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency in the market or any other new, new product, financial product. Why do we care? Why? Because the rules of Sharia cover every aspect of our life, the human life. Yani anything that exists in this universe, the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to have a ruling about it. There are five rules of Sharia. If you study books of Usul al-Fiqh, there are five rules. Anything on this earth, any transaction, any relationship, any action, any type of food has to be included in these five rules. It's either wajib, an obligation, or mustahab, recommended, or haram, not permissible, or disliked, makruh. Makruh يعني, is not haram, but is not encouraged. It's makruh. Right? It's not appreciated. It's better not to do it. But if you do it, you're not sinful. When we say makruh, when we say disliked. If you do it, you're not sinful. Right? But if you do something haram, you are sinful. Or mubah. Mubah يعني, is not wajib. It's not an obligation upon you to do it. And you're not recommended, it's not something that is recommended. And it's not haram, it's not makruh, but it is mubah. Like you sit down with another brother and you keep talking about politics, it's mubah. <laughs> talking about weather, it's mubah. Yeah, it's halal for you to talk about weather, talk about uh, what's going on in the market, right? It's not wajib for you to do it. It's not makruh. It's not unless you keep talking about business here in the masjid. That could be it go to, goes to a different level. It becomes makruh, right? Sometimes if you overdo it, if you overdo it, but outside in the parking definitely is halal in the parking area, right? <laughs> Eating methan watermelon, is it wajib? Hmm? Recommended? No. Right? It's not haram, definitely. Watermelon is halal, right? It's not makruh, you cannot say makruh. So what is the ruling? Mubah. Okay? So this, this principle here is muhim, very important, mubah. It's called ibaha, the original principle, or the principle of original permissibility. al aslu fil ashiya al-ibah. But not al-ibadat. Ibadat is a different story. Anyway, so the point here, Juan, if you bring me anything, 
anything, you bring anything, then the Sharia has to have a rule about it or ruling about it, even if we don't know it. We might know it, right? We might know the ruling of this transaction or this relationship or this whatever arrangement. We might know the ruling, but sometimes maybe we don't know the ruling. We're kind of confused. We're still looking for it. So what is the job of the ulama? Is to discover the ruling. The job of the ulama, our ulama Muslim scholars, is to look into the Quran, look into the sunnah, use these fiqhi maxims, and discover the ruling. This is their job. So by the way, they are not making rulings, rulings by themselves. في بعض الناس أحيانا وذي don't like the statement of some ulama or the advice of some ulama يقول لك هذا الناس هذو حرموا علينا كل شيء they're making everything haram and they don't have the authority to do that no one has the authority to make a ruling or issue a ruling without any proof actually to say something haram you have to have a valid proof but to say it could be mubah it's easy to say mubah because the aslu fil ashya'i al mubah al ibaha, the original principle of original permissibility. By default, things are supposed to be permissible. But if you tell me this water here or this drink here is haram, what is your proof? You have to have a proof. Right? So ulama have, don't have this authority to make things haram, but maybe some of them actually exaggerate and they make mistakes. Why? Because they are? They are humans. Ulama are humans. They might say about something haram, but in reality, it's not haram. In reality, it's not haram. It could be halal in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But their job still is to discover the ruling. Okay? So now, Bitcoin, we have to know the ruling of Bitcoin and the rest of cryptocurrencies. So here we have the principle of original permissibility. It means that everything is permissible unless, unless it is stated otherwise. And it has to be stated in the Quran or the Sunnah or included in a general statement, a general rule that is found in the Quran or the sunnah of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Now this principle here, maybe uh, some people could be you know, confused about it. Uh, what are the proofs? These maxim, fiqhi maxims, all of them have background. Their background is found in the Quran and the sunnah of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa For example here, some of the proofs. هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا so it is he who created for you all that which is on earth. This is in Surah Al-Baqarah. هو الذي خلق لكم ما في الأرض جميعا. يقولون العلماء العلماء يقولون when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala speaks in this language, يتكلم في معرض المن على عباده يمن على عباده. Which means he is reminding his servants about his favors upon them. And a favor cannot be, cannot be haram. A favor cannot be haram. If it is haram, then it's not a favor. It's a restriction. If it is haram. So, في معرض المن على عباده. So, this is the context of this ayat. Have you not seen that Allah, ألم تروا أن الله سخر لكم, سخر لكم. And made subject to you whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. وَأَسْبَغَ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعَمَهُ ظَاهِرَةً وَبَاطِنًا And amply bestowed upon you his favors. So this is a su- ayah in Surah Luqman. And there are some other ayat. The, some other ayat which indicate that الْأَصْلُ فِي الْأَشْيَاءِ الْإِبَاحَةِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has create, he created everything on this earth for people to benefit from it. When it comes to muharramat, we are being tested with this haram items, items, khinzir, alcohol, meita, dead meat, or meat of a dead animal, uh, anything that was slaughtered, you know, with, uh, 
to, to something else, dedicated for something else beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they are counted, they are named, al muharramat are named. And the ulama, they said, you know, they use, as I said, ishtihad to, to reach conclusions about different things. Now there is an exception, all actions of ibadah. All actions of ibadah are an exception. Which means when it comes to ibadah, you cannot come and say, I can create any form of ibadah. We don't have the freedom to add to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't have this freedom. That's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Whoever introduces something new into Islam will have it rejected. So we cannot create a new celebration. That's why we have this debate about Al-Mawlid al Nabawi every year. Celebrating the birthday of the Prophet sallallahu Why? Because he did not celebrate his birthday. The Sahaba did not celebrate his birthday. Right? It did not exist during his time. So those who are saying it's haram, is not halal, they're telling the other group of people, you are adding something new to the religion. Right? Or this rule could apply to anything that is newly introduced in the religion. Don't touch the religion. Religion comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The two main sources of guidance Quran and the Sunnah, right? So we cannot add something new. But when it comes to mu'amalat, then it's a different story. So you see the difference between mu'amalat, human transactions, and between ibadat, acts of worship. There is a big difference. Is that, uh, is that clear, ya akhwan? Now, fiqhi posi positions about Bitcoin. Uh, the, the first position is that it is not permissible to own it or trade it. And that is the first opinion. And this is the opinion of Mufti of Egypt and Mufti Taqi Usmani from Pakistan, Mufti of Turkey. Uh, they call it the religious affairs of Turkey, among others. Uh, the second uh, position is that it is permissible to deal with it within the boundaries of Sharia. Within the boundaries of Sharia, this is very important. So, and this is the opinion, the recent opinion of Amja. Amja is, is Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America. They hold, they used to hold, they used to hold the, the tawaqquf, the third opinion, unable to issue a fatwa about it for years, for a couple of years. But recently, uh, I guess in 2022, last year, they made a different fatwa and, it, uh, and they believe now it is permissible after doing a research about it, extensive research about it. And now they believe that it is permissible to deal with it within the boundaries of Sharia. Muhammad al-Hassan al-Daddu, he's a, a Muslim school, a scholar. He's originally from Mauritania, but he lives, I guess, in Turkey or, or Qatar. And he's a big name in the Arab world. Yani he's a highly qualified scholar, and many people in the Arab world believe that he could be the, the, the most knowledgeable person on earth. I don't believe in that, but, but I would say that he's a highly qualified scholar. Uh, Allahu alam, who is the most knowledgeable person on earth nowadays. But at least he is a highly respected and highly qualified Muslim scholar, Muhammad al Hassan al Daddu, and he believes it is permissible. Economics Forum, Islamic Economics Forum, this group of, big group of Muslim scholars, most of them are PhD holders. And the Fiqh Council of North America and others. So this group of Muslim scholars and different organizations, they believe that it is permissible to deal with it within the boundaries of Sharia. Unable to issue a fatwa about it, when they say we are unable to issue a fatwa about it, that means this technology is not clear for us. We're not able to say it's haram. We're not able to say it's halal, right? At tawaqquf, it's called in Arabic at tawaqquf. And this is the, the position of Islam Q&A, question and, and answer, and some other, some other uh, Muslim scholars. They said, and I respect this position. I respect this, this opinion. And it's not a hukum. 
التوقف is not a حكم they're not this is not a ruling شريعة ruling is just saying that we are not able to issue a fatwa about it because we don't have enough knowledge about it. This is what they are saying. We don't have enough knowledge about it. We need to understand this new technology, the blockchain technology, the proof of work system, and, and uh, the, you know, many questions about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Many questions. It's a big domain now. And it's not easy to understand. You need to spend time with it to research it. Now, those who are saying Bitcoin is haram, this is their, uh, this, their, these are their arguments. Okay, so no one is using a, an ayah from the Quran. No one is using a hadith from the, the Sunnah of Rasulullah. Why? Because there is nothing about Bitcoin in the Quran. There is nothing about Bitcoin in the Sunnah of our Messenger. It makes sense, right? They cannot use, there is nothing. It's something new, right? So they have to look into different things, different arguments. They said it can be easily used for illegal activities. Money laundering, tax evasion, and so on and so forth. This is the first argument. It can be easily used for illegal activities. Number two, it is speculative, very speculative, highly speculative amounting to gambling. Speculative is to guess. When you speculate, you are guessing about the price movement without enough knowledge. So you spend money, you invest money, hoping to make quick, quick, uh, you know, profits while taking some high, facing at the same time, some high risks. So basically, yeah, these are, these, this could be the definition of speculation. مضاربة تسمى باللغة العربية المضاربة على الأسعار. Third argument they said is not real currency because it's a digital asset. Uh, it's secured by cryptography. is uh, is in the computer. You cannot you cannot carry it in your hand. Bitcoin you cannot carry it in your hand. Huh? So they're saying it's not real money. It has no intrinsic value. Which means it has no real value. This is, these are their arguments. And it is not controlled by a legitimate central authority. So what is, what is about, uh, I, think, I think this is the main feature, one of the main features of all cryptocurrencies. And they are, they are decentralized. They are not controlled by any central authority. No bank, central bank, no government is controlling these cryptocurrencies. Of course, uh, they're trying to make their own digital currency, like the US dollar. The American government, they have their own digital currency. Uh, Euro has a digital form. Uh, some other countries, Japan, different countries, they have their own digital you know, currencies. But that's a different story. When we talk about a digital form of the US dollar is still controlled by the bank, by, by the government, the US government, right? But here we're talking about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that are out of you know, control, out of the control of any legitimate central authority. Now, Bitcoin is halal. These are the arguments who, of those who said it's halal. They use the principle of original permissibility. And I explained it to you, right? Al-aslu fil ashiya al Things are, by default, are halal, are mubah, unless otherwise you know, stated in the Quran or the Sunnah. They said nothing in Sharia, Quran and Sunnah suggests that money has to be issued by central authority. There are opinions, fiqhi opinions, like Imam Ahmed, he did not allow people during his time to mint money. He said it's haram to mint money. But he didn't use a, uh, like a, an ayah from the Quran or a hadith. What he said? He said, الناس إذا رخص لهم أتوا بالعظائم what he meant is, he used the dalil of sadd al-dhara'i'ah, sadd al What is sadd al Is blocking the means of evil. That means if we open the door for people to make money, to mint dinars out of gold and, and, and dirhams out of silver, they will start what? Doing what? Cheating, they will start cheating. They will mix gold with something else. 
and then money is not pure anymore and people will lose trust in money and then there will be a big problem. You get a, a, a golden dinar, you don't know if it is pure or not. Right? Because everyone is making his own golden dinars, everyone is making his own dirhams. So Imam Ahmed believed that is not permissible during his time. Al Imam al Nawawi, this is what he said. They said, This is the position of the Shafi'i Madhab. Imam Abu Hanifa said, No, during his time. Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullah alayhi said, People are allowed to make money, emit their own currency if they don't cheat. If they do it, if they do it in the right way. That was his opinion. And I guess he was not worried about inflation because the, 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 the amount or the gold supply is limited. Gold is limited on this earth, right? So there will be no inflation. Maybe, Wallahu alam, this is my personal understanding. Uh, their argument, the third argument is, and of course, when, when they say nothing in Sharia suggests that money has to be issued by a central authority, they looked at the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu they found nothing. He didn't say anything about who has the authority to mint, you know, money. Who has the authority to make money, to produce money. He didn't say anything. So they're looking at the Quran and the Sunnah and there is nothing that says, you know, this should be done by a central authority or the government. But when we study the opinion of Imam Ahmed, we understand why. Why he said it's not permissible. Imagine now if people are allowed to make money, to print Canadian dollars. What will happen? Huh? No value at all, right? No value, inflation. So people will be affected. There is no doubt about it. So we understand these rulings, right? They said, number three, Bitcoin is acceptable as a currency for real state, uh, real sale transactions in many shops around the world. And this is true. You know, there is a real estate company in Alberta. They're accepting Bitcoin as a payment for real estate. There are many shops, many restaurants are accepting Bitcoins. Uh, one brother told me in a country, again, the, the financial system in that country collapsed collapsed. Their money has no value. I don't want to mention names of different countries, but their money has no value. The bank is telling them, you have money in the bank, but you cannot withdraw it. They cannot withdraw the money. So now people in that country are looking for other options. Doing what? They're using Bitcoin. So uh, the brother told me, he was with in my office yesterday. He said, I was there in the summer. You go to a restaurant and you buy food, when you want to pay, they give you a receipt in different, different currencies. U.S. dollar, um, the local currency, I guess, the local currency, and Bitcoin. Bitcoin, you can pay in U.S. dollar, you can pay in the local currency. Of course, local currency, you have to carry <laughs> a big box. <laughs> You have to carry a big bag with you, right? In the local. If you're using uh, American dollar, is a few bills in your, in your wallet. Or Bitcoin, you use your phone, your machine, and that's it, you make the payment. I told him in the capital city, no, he said in small villages. In small villages, people are accepting, and this is a Muslim country. And I'm talking about a Muslim country, I'm not talking about El Salvador. I'll tell you about Salvador. <laughs> I'm not talking about Salvador. I'm talking about a Muslim country where, the, and this is happening in many countries. The value of their money has collapsed, so they don't have trust in this fiat system anymore, people. And they're looking for alternatives. Fiat money, this is a very important argument. If you go back to the argument of the first group of people, Okay, can be easily used for illegal activities, speculative, not real currency, uh, has no intrinsic value. They are saying fiat money is exposed to all the issues raised against Bitcoin with the exception of the official recognition. This is the only exception. So money laundering, people are doing it with fiat money. Tax evasion, they're doing it with fiat money. All the crimes that are there in the society are being done with fiat money. It's the same thing. 
You tell me money is not a real money, but the fiat money also, you know the creation of money within the banking system? You know, our banks create money out of nothing. They create money. That's why when there is a crisis, they said the economy has lost two trillions or three trillions dollars. How? How this money, I mean, if it was a real money, it was paper money, physical money, how can we lose it? It should be there, within the same, used, being circulated within the same society. No, they tell you, because of this crisis, the economy has lost these three trillions, four trillion dollars. Why? Because it was money that was created out of nothing within the banking system. Through the lending transactions, when they lend money to corporations and government together, they create more money with numbers. These are electronic, it's electronic money. So anyway, it has no intrinsic value. They said fiat money has no intrinsic value. It's just paper. If the government stops, as I said, decides to stop using paper money, this paper that you have in your pocket will have no value. You can give it to your children, they will play with it. It will become like a Canadian tire money. <laughs> you know Canadian tire money? <laughs> you put it there in a, at home and you leave it there for years. No one cares about it, right? You might use it if you want to get a discount of $1, $2, but no one cares about it. But if this money, if the government decides not to use it, then this money that we have will have no value at all. So there is no intrinsic value. So these had all these issues that you raised against Bitcoin, all of them are found with fiat money, with the exception, one exception, that fiat money is, has been made uh, officially, uh, the official legal tender through the decree of the government. Yani the government decreed that this year. Now the exception now is the Salvador, is an exception since June 2021. Now they accept Bitcoin as a legal tender. And of course, be, be, beside the US dollar and their, local, and their local currency. So Bitcoin is not the only form of money that is used in Salvador, but it is officially now accepted as a legal tender in, in Salvador. Now, those who said it's halal, and by the way, if you ask me my opinion, I am with the second group of people who said it is halal. I, because the, the principle of al-aslu fil ashiya al-ibaha, principle of original permissibility is very strong. Is very strong. The principle, yes, brother. Let, let me continue and then we uh, give you some time for questions. I'll finish within five minutes. So now, when it comes to restrictions and recommendations, they said, those who said it's halal to use it, Bitcoin, I'm talking about Bitcoin, by the way. I'm talking about Bitcoin, I'm not talking about the other cryptocurrencies, maybe Ethereum, there are some scholars that both of them should be accepted, should be halal, Bitcoin and Ethereum. I'm not talking about the other cryptocurrencies. There are thousands of cryptocurrencies in the market. Some of them are not real. Some of them are scams. Some of them are used for haram purposes. So there are different types of, uh, I'm talking only, whatever I said today is about Bitcoin, right? Because the other, the other, Solana and Cordano and all the other, I mean, you have to, if you have a question about any cryptocurrency, then you need to approach a scholar who has knowledge about this field and he, he will tell you if he knows about any new cryptocurrency. But what I'm talking, the debate now, the debate that I shared with you, and I'll tell you about the sources. You can review and look at the debate and study it and read it. There is research that has been done. You can read it by yourself. It's about Bitcoin. Okay, I'm not saying the other ones are haram. There could be some halal cryptocurrencies. It's just this discussion is about Bitcoin. So they said all the rulings of riba will apply to Bitcoin as they do for fiat money. So if we accept Bitcoin as a currency, then we have to apply all the rules of riba to it. And exchanging Bitcoin with other currencies, uh, cryptocurrencies or fiat money, must be done at spot as a spot trade. So the delivery of both counter values has to happen within the same uh, session. 
So that means you have to pay attention to the slippage. You have to deal with, if you want to buy and trade Bitcoin, you have to deal with regulated exchanges. Uh, be careful about you know, uh, trading Bitcoin in the US. The market here is more regulated in Canada, is more regulated, is safer to buy and trade uh, Bitcoin here than in the US. You have to be careful. You have to do your due diligence. By saying it's halal, he said, they are saying permissibility does not mean that Bitcoin investment is a good one. It doesn't mean that. These Muslim scholars who said it's halal, they're not saying it's safe. They're saying you have to do your due diligence if you decide to invest in Bitcoin. You have to do your homework. And you have to be careful about the rules of riba. So there is a difference between buying Bitcoin through an exchange, a regulated exchange, and buying Bitcoin through an ATM. The transaction is not completed on the spot through an ATM. There are some ATMs here in Calgary and in Edmonton, in Alberta, in, uh, in Canada. So, so the, when you buy a Bitcoin through an ATM, the transaction is not completed on the spot. But through exchanges, regulated exchanges, yes, you might, you might see it. You, you own the money right away. There could be a delay a few seconds. It doesn't affect the transaction a few seconds, 10 seconds, more than 10 seconds, a little bit. It doesn't affect the smooth. The, it's still accepted. But if it is one hour, two hours, it's a different problem. So you have to, you have to be careful about the rules of riba. They said it is permissible to mine bitcoins. Zakat is due on bitcoins investment. When you pay zakat, you have to look at the value of your bitcoin investment. And, uh, and pay the zakat. And also there is something else, Methan Wealth Simple here in Canada, the, 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 they have a Bitcoin investment, but it's not real money. Their investment is about CFDs. We talked about CFDs last time, contracts for difference. So people, you know, uh, invest in the, the, um, the, the, the they track the, the price movement of the Bitcoin, and they get rewarded if their betting is right on the difference of the prices. So if the price goes up by like $20, they receive this $20 as a profit. But they don't own the Bitcoin itself. You have to be careful. This is haram. We said, you know, it's not, uh, it's not permissible. So you have to be careful. There are different types of, of uh, investment when it comes to Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. But the point is... What I'm trying to share today is a basic principle, is a basic ruling that it is permissible to own it and it is a per, per, uh, permissible to trade it if you do it in a halal way. And then when it comes to halal way, you have to be careful. You do your due diligence and you study the market and you try to learn and educate yourself, see what, how to do it in a halal way. If you want to be involved. And also you pay attention to the rules of zakat. You have to pay zakat if you own it as an asset. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Now these are the resources. As I said in Investopedia, uh, if you want to study about cryptocurrency, they will give you uh, a good amount of knowledge there. Islamic Economic Forum's declaration on Bitcoin. It's a long declaration, a long discussion that is found on fiqhcouncil.org is the Fiqh Council of North America. So you can go just search for Bitcoin on their website, and there are two fatwas there. One of them is the declaration of this Islamic Economic Forum. It's a long discussion. They tell you about all this research and the, uh, the opinion of ulama. Decrypting Cryptocurrency, a Fiqh Perspective on Cryptocurrencies by Jamal Zarabuzu. It's a research paper that was done by Jamal Zarabuzo. He's a, mashallah, a very good Muslim scholar from the United States of America. And it was done, it is available on, on amjaonline.org, the website of Amja, Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America. It's a good paper, you can read it, maybe 20 pages, 30 pages. And, uh, and he talks about this, uh, this different opinions and discussion between different scholars. It's a very good paper. You can read it and get a perspective, inshallah. But as I said, if you ask me my opinion, I believe it is permissible because of the principle of al-ibah al-asliya, al-ibah al-asliya fil-mu'amalat. 
you know, the, the principle of original permissibility? Wallahu a'lam. If you want more knowledge about different products in the market, like cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin, from, uh, from a financial perspective, not Sharia perspective, we can do workshops. Are you, are you, do, you, do you think it's a good idea to invite some people who know more about these things? Because I have two people who approached us. One, of, one brother, he wants to do a workshop about personal finance. Personal insurance and uh, RSPs and, and all these accounts that are found there in the market. Not from a Sharia perspective. So I'll come with him, sit down. He, was not, he will not, the brother will not talk about Sharia, halal or haram. But he will try to educate the community about diff, different products that are found in the market. Including Bitcoin, we have a group of brothers who wants to do a presentation about it. Are you interested in this kind of uh, presentations? Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll, inshallah, we'll let you know. Inshallah, we'll give you uh, an update about this. We'll give you a date. And most likely it will be in the, in the youth center. We'll, we'll have our screens there, sisters one, one side, brothers on one side. And then it will be a, a sort, sort of workshop, like for two hours, maybe three hours. And then uh, we'll talk about these, uh, these inshallah, uh, things in, in detail. Now, do you have any question? Yes, brother, you raised your hand first. Ma'lish, he raised his uh, hand before you. So, uh, uh, that means that Bitcoin has a set amount of, uh, of mining, let's say, which is, which is better than uh, the fiat. Do you agree on that? Yeah, they said it's limited. Bitcoin supply is limited, 21 million Bitcoins. So that's, that's the, yeah. But every Bitcoin is equal to 100 million Satoshis. Yeah, so, yeah, it is limited, yeah. And that's why some people, Allah, I don't want to speculate, but that's a different story. It is limited, yeah, 21 million. Uh, and uh, the issuer or the one who created this, uh, this new technology, I mean, he used blockchain technology. His name is Satoshi Nakamoto, I think. That's the name. And it's a mysterious person, like, until now, he's unknown. They don't know who is he. Allahu alam. I don't know if it is a game. It's a real person and they know who he is. They're hiding his personality. Or they really don't know about him. Allahu alam. He white. He wrote to author the white paper. Because every cryptocurrency has a white paper. It's like a manual, right? It tells you about, gives you information, technical information about the, the coin. So he authored the white paper of Bitcoin in 2008. It was launched in 2009. It, in 2009. And now in, 20, in 2023, the value of Bitcoin is in Canadian dollars is around close to 50,000. It's around 47,000 Canadian dollars. The value of one Bitcoin. Yeah, Allahu alam. So this is not this is not important because there are some ulama who had an objection against Bitcoin. They raised this objection about they said the issuer is unknown, but the protocol is known, and how the technology works is known. It's not a secret. Yeah, and who cares? I mean, who cares about the person who wrote the white paper or the one who launched this technology. I mean, they said, the, the, some brothers are saying his contribution was the, the, the proof of work system. That is his big blockchain technology existed before, before this person came into the picture. Okay. Uh, another question then we uh, allow sisters to ask if you have questions, sisters. Yes, brother. Naam? You, you, do, you do what? Marketing for them? Help them to get more clients? Yeah. yeah. 
So the basic, the basic ruling regarding this kind of jobs is that halal. You're not responsible for their actions, right? Because they could be, they could be uh, selling this car cash, like in a halal way, they could be selling this car in a haram way, but at the end, it is their responsibility. If you are doing marketing in a halal way, especially when you are dealing with a company that deals with halal and haram, you're not responsible for their haram activities. If your service is halal and your work is halal, you're not directly involved in any haram transaction, then your job should be fine. Wallahu ta'ala. Let me give a chance to someone else. Sisters, do you have a question? Okay. Any other question? Because we have only ten, five minutes for the adhan. Five minutes, yes, brother. What do, you, what do you mean high level overview of it? What is the most, uh, most uh, well, I mean, if you want to talk about definition of riba, there are different types of riba, right? But the most dangerous type of riba is the one that is mentioned in the Quran, in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You go to Surah Al-Baqarah, page, uh, the, the ayah from 275 to 2, 281. It's a full page. 275 to 281. And this is, these are the last verses revealed about riba. This riba is called riba ad duyun Riba of debts. Right? So you give a debt, a loan to someone, and you ask him to pay a premium on the capital of the loan. Interest, Interest yes. A premium, something extra. Right? Either for above the loan, the, ca the capital amount of the loan, or for extending, extending the maturity of the loan. Let's say, مثلاً, you tell him, I'm not going to charge you, you, you make a credit sale, and you tell the client, I'm not going to charge you riba or interest for one month. After one month, if you, you want to extend, this uh, transaction or this uh, agreement, you want another extra three months, I will charge you every month $10, for example. This $10, three months, the total is $30, is riba. So the extra money that we pay, we pay above the capital amount of a loan or the price of a credit sale. Because when, when you make a credit sale, you, the customer will receive the commodity, but he will pay later. He will pay later after one month or two months, or he will make part of the payment up front, and portion of the payment will be delayed. So if you charge him some extra money, I mean, if you are, again, if you are uh, someone who is selling, and you increase the price for financing that is halal, if you increase the price from day one, Say, I'll sell you this car for 10000 but if you pay me within two years, the price will be 12000 This is halal, this is not riba, right? But if you tell him, if you default, or you want to extend the maturity of this, uh, this uh, agreement, then you'll pay extra money, and that is riba. When you take a loan from the bank, do the, the, does the bank give you a free loan? Bank will never give you a free loan. They will charge you 5%, 10, 4%. This is riba. So, and this is the most dangerous form of riba. It's called riba duyun. Riba of debts and loans. And, the, and this is the one mentioned in the Quran. What about a mortgage? Mortgage in itself is halal. Mortgage is called rahan in Islam. Right? Pledging something as a, a collateral or a, a, as a security. This transaction itself is, har is halal. What is haram about conventional mortgages to buy houses in North America is the interest that is applied to the total amount or the capital, the, the initial price of the house. So the house was sold for 300,000. The bank will charge you, let's say 500, half a million 
So 200,000 is riba. But the 300,000, which is the initial price of the house, is the capital uh, amount of the loan. So the bank is giving you a loan and charging you interest. This interest is riba, it's haram. Not every type of interest is riba, right? But every riba is haram, every form of riba is haram. Yeah, as I said, financing, when you increase the price from day one, while doing financing, financing, it's halal. If it is within the same, within the original agreement, within the original agreement. Is that clear? But you can study riba, I mean, there are different forms of riba, riba al-buyu' that is found in the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu but as I said, the most dangerous form of riba is riba duyun, and it is the one that is mentioned in the Quran. Allah ibarak fiq. Taib, jazakumullahu khairan, barakallahu fikum. We make adhan, inshallah. So we will do workshops, inshallah, in the future, bi ta'ala. But next week, Sheikh Hamza is supposed to come and start a new program about Jerusalem and the legacy of the city in the Islamic history. Bayt al-Maqdis. Jazakumullahu khairan.